name is David Jonathan, mostly called as uh, Johnny. I work in Luton uh, with a Christian ecumenical program of community engagement called Grassroots, which is supported by different church denominations. And we are very grateful that uh, the Thames North Synod of United Reformed Church also supports us. Uh, and we are indeed very grateful for that. As a community worker today, what I'm going to share uh, is more of uh, a Bible, a biblical reflection. I arrived in Luton in 2001 with the support from CWM, Council for World Mission, and United Reformed Church to begin my work with churches and with different faith communities in Luton. And that was October 2001, which was soon after 9-11 had happened, um, the terror attacks on the uh, Twin Towers in US. I remember everyone saying then that the world has changed forever. But I also often remember reflecting myself that who are these people who are likely to be affected most and worst by these changes? And soon I realized it was Muslims and people from black and Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds, particularly if they had beard like I have. Um, it was their world that had changed more than anyone else's forever. Likewise, we keep hearing people say that these days that coronavirus has changed the world um, forever. And I am still thinking and wondering and reflecting who are and who will be these people whose world will have been affected most and worst by the coronavirus. They say coronavirus does not discriminate true. All nations, all races, rich and poor, we are all affected by it. But then why a third, if not more, of critically ill coronavirus patients in our hospitals are from black and Asian minority ethnic backgrounds, while they only make up 14% of the total population? In my view, one of the biggest underlying factors driving such disproportionate numbers of deaths in black and Asian minority ethnic communities is socioeconomic conditions of people. And this by no means, I am saying something new, it's no mean, by no means a new revelation. Charities like mine, Grassroots in Luton, and even programs um, at the United Reformed Church like Commitment for Life, we have been campaigning and fighting against these injustices for years. But unless governments act to mitigate the risks, the life-threatening risks faced by the Black and Asian and minority ethnic communities. There's little hope for British values of justice and peace and equality and fairness for all, without which it is not ethical for us and it is not fair for us to keep saying that we are all in it together because we know we are not. Otherwise, someone's race, someone's socioeconomic condition will not determine their life expectancy. In the Council for World Mission consultation, CWM consultation last year that I attended, I remember reflecting on few questions which included questions like, you know, big threatening questions, who am I and what am I here for? but also on the questions like, who holds power in the places where I live and work? Who is not heard? Who is not acknowledged? Who is not seen? Who we conveniently make invisible at times in the places where I live and work? And I must confess that despite the fact that I'm involved in these kinds of activities and this kind of work, I began to see what I did not see earlier. These simple but profound questions, if also asked in the context of coronavirus, I'm sure it can give us a good reality check on how much actually we are all in it together. 
In the Old Testament, I'm particularly touched by the book of Jeremiah and particularly chapter 29. And I won't be reading out the whole chapter, but I would like to read out three verses from this chapter, verses 1 and verses 5 and 7. The first verse gives the introduction saying, this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people who had gone into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then in verses 5 and 7, Jeremiah says to Israelites, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, reading and reflecting, not just on these three verses, but on the whole of Jeremiah's chapter 29, one could learn about the real or perceived insecurities and challenges that the Jews faced and confronted when trying to settle down in Babylon, which is why Jeremiah had to write this letter. Perhaps there are lessons we could learn from it about how black and Asian minority ethnic communities must feel in Britain today. We could reflect and learn from how Babylonians may have behaved and responded to the migrant communities of Jews attempting to settle down at that time. But beyond all this, I think the text of Jeremiah's letter for me conveys quite distinctly one thing, and that is that God's power seeks to be characterized by personal and relational, by intercommunal and neighborly relationships. It encourages us all to seek mutual well-being and prosperity of one another. Hence, the verse 7 says that seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And it is high time, I think, that we acknowledge the fact that it is in the well-being of Britain that migrants seek their own well-being. It is not at the cost of Britain's well-being, like many times media portrays. It is indeed in the well-being of Britain that migrants and Black and Asian and other minority ethnic communities seek their own well-being. And this is, of course, well-known and well-established and well-researched fact that from Atlantic slave trade to Windrush and from Brexit to coronavirus, Britain's well-being and Britain's survival has depended on immigrants. And it continues to depend on people from Black and Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds, as we see how many of them in NHS have risked and laid down their lives in their efforts to save Britain from coronavirus. So Jeremiah's letter shows what our God wants from us. It shows that people like you and me, who are set and stubborn in our ways and beliefs in every age and every era have been and will continue to be called for a change. So for the host white indigenous majorities, and particularly for the churches, Many of the white indigenous majorities still profess their faith in Jesus Christ as their personal savior. So for all of them, I would say the privilege of being God's people comes with responsibilities of accepting and acknowledging God's gifts in the form of black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities in Britain making such positive and sacrificial contributions, not now, but from, from years and from centuries we have been doing that. And so this realization must stir in us a desire to ask and reflect on these questions that as government of Britain, as Christians living in Britain, as churches in Britain, who are we and who are we for? Who are we meant to be and for whom? And acknowledging and identifying where the powers are, we must also look for who is not being heard, who is not being acknowledged, who is not being treated fairly, and who are 
these people who get left out and dropped off when we say that we are all in it together.